The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, may I begin by wishing you and all uh, members and members of the staff a happy first full day of spring. Uh, I would like, uh, beyond that, to begin by telling you about a conversation that took place recently in North Sydney. Last month, a man named Lawrence Shabib from North Sydney was interviewed by the Cape Breton Post. For the past 14 years, Mr. Shabib has been a volunteer at the North Sydney Community Food Bank. The subject of the interview was the decline of food bank donations so far in 2018 and the consequent decline of what the North Sydney Food Bank is able to provide. This is what Mr. Shabib said. He said, we're down probably as low as it has ever been since the food bank has been in North Sydney. And I'll, I'll table this copy of his remarks. Then he was asked about his view of the reasons for this. And Mr. Shabib identified two factors. People are getting poorer, he said, and the community service payments haven't kept up to the cost of living. And then Mr. Shabib was asked how the food bank is coping with this changed situation. And he gave this reply. He said, we usually give three cans of soup, but now we're down to two. Now, Mr. Speaker, I would like to hold Mr. Shabib's sentence here before this house. We used to give three cans of soup, but now we're down to two. Mr. Shabib's comment provides a way into evaluating the proposed 2018-19 budget that is before us. It provides a way of summarizing the budget's shortcomings and the budget's absence of constructive vision. We used to give away three cans, but now we're down to two. Mr. Speaker, what I want to suggest is that what we have before us at the moment here in this House is a two-can budget. What we've got is a two-can budget, a budget that does not address significantly the situation Mr. Shabib describes, a budget which, in the midst of escalating and ever sharper need, fails to provide what is required, a budget which is deeply of a piece with the overall situation in which people who used to reach in the bag and bring out three cans of soup now reach in the bag and draw out two. Mr. Speaker, we are examining we are evaluating, we are speaking to a two-can budget, the authors of which are a two-can government who have a two-can understanding. It's a two-can budget from a whole range of points of view, but there are two that bear particular mentioning. The two uh, angles from which we can see this budget as a two-can budget that uh, uh, bear particular mentioning are, one, the fact that the budget is such a betrayal of the young people of Nova Scotia, and two, the fact that the budget is such a betrayal of the old. It's certainly a two-can budget if you're a, a young person starting out in Nova Scotia today with the $40,000 debt from a first degree, which is the average level of indebtedness uh, of the graduates of this province. It's absolutely a two-can budget from the point of view of the young person in Nova Scotia who looks to New Brunswick, where if your family income is under $60,000 a year, your in-province tuition is entirely paid for, or to, for the young person who looks to Ontario, where your tuition is covered uh, for the students of all families making under 50000 or the young person who looks to Newfoundland and Labrador, where average tuition is $2,600, or for the young person who looks to Quebec, 
where average tuition is $3,100, for the young person who then, having looked at all this, registers the fact that here in Nova Scotia, our average university tuition of $7,726 is the fastest rising anywhere in the country. It's a two-can budget for the one in three residents of our province who did not or who know someone closely who would not apply to a post-secondary institution because it would mean incurring too much debt. And over and over again, when the deep pain of this betrayal of a generation has been raised here in the legislature, the government has offered its stock replies about increased amounts students are now allowed to borrow, about options for loan forgiveness, about jobs opened up by the government's programs to graduate to this and that. Uh, but this is all fog. This is all mist, cloud, a shroud of obfuscation. There is a question on this before us, and it's this. Are those who do not come from money more likely to be able to open up wider opportunities for themselves through post-secondary education as a result of the budget the government has placed before us? That is the question that we have on this angle before us. And there is an answer to this question that was being resonated loud and clear while the budget speech was yesterday being read by students outside on the street. And the answer to the question that they were registering was unequivocally a no. And since that's the case, young people in Nova Scotia are entirely justified to say today this is a two-can budget. What we have in Nova Scotia today is a two-can government. And the problem with this two-can government is that it has a two-can point of view. It's a two-can budget for sure for the 7,000 people in Nova Scotia who live in nursing homes who have seen a net nearly $5 million reduction over the past two years to the funds which sustain diet, recreational programming, and staffing in the institutions where they live, a net reduction which remains unreplaced and unrectified by the present budget. And a two-can budget for sure to the 2,000 people who lived in hospitals in Nova Scotia last year while they waited for placement in a nursing home. Because the, the waits are long as a result of the fact that in five years, not a single new nursing home bed has been opened anywhere across the province. And now, as a consequence of this budget, these waits stand to be lengthened because it is a singular failure of the government plan put forward in yesterday's budget, that by means of it, not one new long-term bid is going to be established. And what does that mean in practice? In practice, I have a pretty good sense of what it means uh, from uh, having spent the majority of my adult life as a United Church minister and having spent, it feels to me often, like a few million hours uh, visiting in nursing homes. What this means in practice is that there are going to be a whole lot more of those Sunday afternoon family visit conversations that are going to follow what has by now become uh, the familiar pattern. The family is there and the person in the hospital bed says, well, have you heard anything from them this week about uh, how much longer? And the answer comes back, uh, no, mom, uh, uh, no, dad, but, uh, but look, I keep calling them every week and every time that our party has raised this matter in the House. The government response has been uh, about home care and about the unquestioned value of people's being able to remain as long as possible in their homes. But this is to compare an apricot with a spruce tree. 
because every one of those alternate level of care people living in our hospitals is there because a professional care assessment has been offered and concluded and given to them which has said to them, it is no longer tenable, it is no longer safe for you. You must go to the hospital and wait for a nursing home because it's not tenable or safe for you any longer to be living in your home. So the nursing home people who haven't yet made it to a nursing home, living in hospitals, and the nursing home residents who are living in nursing homes now where they've had the cutbacks, all of them, and it's a large number of people in Nova Scotia, are absolutely justified in assessing the finance minister's proposal before this house as a two-can budget from a two-can government with a two-can understanding. Now, uh, Mr. Speaker, before I continue, uh, would it be in order for me to ask you to reestablish the floor for me? Order, please. The Honourable Member for Halifax Shabakto has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, let me say with uh, a little more precision what I really mean by the phrase a two can government. A two-can government, in my estimation, is one that is so singularly obsessed with creating and hoarding and gathering and proclaiming the surpluses of its budgets that it misses out on the signature investments in our people, our incomes, our opportunities, our care. The signature investments in our people that would fundamentally uplift the life of our province. A two-can government, in my judgment, Mr. Speaker, is one that will only countenance, will only consider those investments that can be made within the fiscal limits of an annually surplus generating budget, which means that it fails to make the very investments that would have the capacity to comprehensively address the crisis of income inadequacy and of opportunity, the crisis that are so fundamentally holding us back in Nova Scotia at the moment. And Mr. Speaker, we have heard here in the legislature many, many times the government's response to the call for such investments. Whether that call has been a call to eliminate poverty or to uh, wipe out tuition at the Nova Scotia Community College or a call to provide care to those who have come to a point in life where a higher level of care is what's required. At every time, in some form or another, uh, when the call for those investments has come uh, from this part of the People's House, the response has come from the government in some form or another, something like this. We are, I quote, we are too responsible, uh, the view is offered from the Liberals, uh, we are too responsible to address those kinds of investments because by means of that we would pass a debt on to our children and our grandchildren and we will not do that. But it is a moment for us as we look and evaluate the budget that has been placed before us to call this pseudo argument out for exactly what it is. It is an over-focus on the short term. It's an over-focus on the present, on that which can be accomplished within the electoral cycle, uh, disguised, paraded, masqueraded, as though it were a concern for the generations of the future. Mr. Speaker, we can think of our province as though it were a house. Let us say a person had a house and the roof leaked in 18 different places. And you ask the person, what are you going to do about all those leaks in your roof? Now, if the person replied, oh, I might patch up one or two of those holes, but as far as the roof in general goes, my household economy doesn't generate enough surplus this year to fix it, and I'm not one of those people who would leave a debt to their children and their grandchildren, so I'm just going to let it go. Would not most of us, if we were in such a conversation at that point, have a look at the damage that's being done to the gyp rock, have a look to the, to the damage that's being done to the ceiling, uh, look at all the water that was running in and filling up the 18 buckets and say, oh, for heaven's sake, you fool. 
That's exactly what we would say, Mr. Speaker. And so I want to say this as carefully as I can. Do you see those young people who aren't going to school beyond grade 12 because their families can't afford it? Do you see those children growing up in homes where the income isn't ever enough to think about anything about survival uh, except survival and the scarcity? That in Nova Scotia, they in Nova Scotia are our roof, Mr. Speaker. They're our roof. They're our, the trusses of our roof. They're the structure of our roof. They're the chimney in our roof. They're the whole thing. And it would pay us, and I say that absolutely literally, it would pay us if we would make the investments that we require on this fund, notwithstanding the fact that that could mean for us some medium to short-term debt. Mr. Speaker, this is precisely what the Governor of the Bank of Canada, Stephen Paulos, was talking about last week when he spoke about how Quebec's major investment in a universally accessible childcare system provides a successful model for economic development because, the Governor of the Bank of Canada explained, the growth-related benefits of women's improved participation in the labour force as a result of the investment exceed the costs in the longer term of the investment as a whole. And this is exactly what the major studies of the effect of child poverty on economic growth are talking about when they demonstrate the now widely accepted view that childhood poverty exerts a downward effect in the area of around 4% of GDP on overall economic health. This is exactly what Dr. Ryan Mealy, the newly elected leader of the Saskatchewan New Democratic Party, is talking about in his book on health care reform, when he points out that every medical student Every nursing student at a very early point in their training is taught the first rule of the field of the social determinants of health, namely that the leading, ultimately deciding factors that determine whether a person is going to be healthy or ill in life, whether they're going to require hundreds of thousands of dollars in health care and treatment over their lifetime or whether they're not, that the leading, determining, deciding factor about that in a person's life is not smoking, is not diet, is not exercise. There are two determining factors. All the medical students, Mr. Speaker, all the nursing students are taught as they begin their medical formation. Two things that decide that. One, income. Two, education. This is exactly why so many jurisdictions across the Western world, states and other places, have now stepped forward to eliminate community college tuition because they've seen and comprehended the economic numbers. And they know that while an investment certainly is needed up front in order to achieve the goal, the returns in terms of expanded tax paying capacity are such that in Nova Scotia, for every dollar we would invest in eliminating the tuition of an NSCC student, we would be $7.20 money in over that student's tax-paying working lifetime. And we ought not to need economists to help us understand any of this. Our own experience and the experience of the people we know makes it clear. We hear so much about our demographic challenges and challenges posed here by an aging population. Let us think for a moment about a young couple. A young couple who graduate, uh, complete their uh, post-secondary education. Let us say they've got between them three degrees. Let us say they didn't come from a privileged background, so they owe somewhere around $100,000 or a little better in student debt. Now, does anyone think that this couple's net purchasing stimulative effect on our economy is improved by the fact that they've got a new car payment which is going to be less than the monthly amount that they owe in their student loan. And does anyone not seriously think that their level of indebtedness is not going to have a real and serious impact on the age that that couple will be when they decide to start a family? Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Finance I think this is an appropriate word, bragged about how Nova Scotia is one of only two provinces 
which share our province's current fiscal path. Yes, and we are presumably to infer from this, to draw from this, that uh, there is some level of skill or prudence, some level of fiscal competence in the government of Nova Scotia that is not apparent in all those other jurisdictions. But in fact, the very opposite is the case. Jurisdictions across our country and around the world are rather recognizing this present moment when governments can make investments at locked in historic low interest levels, are recognizing this present moment as a moment not for fiscal retraction, but a moment for expansion and stimulus and investment in creating a broader future. And this, in fact, is the prevailing consensus of the best thinking available at the moment in economics. The world has moved to a new place, and the Liberal government of Nova Scotia has failed to have its eyes open to the new prevailing reading of the situation, the view that public investment in the public creates economic growth, magnifies government revenue, and the medium-term benefits of that resultant growth exceed the costs incurred in aggregate interest output. And all of that is not even to speak of the enhancements of productivity that are affected by comprehensive improvements in educational attainment of the sort that can only be achieved by comprehensive improvements in children's household family income. So to proceed, as this budget does on a basis that does not acknowledge any of this truth is the work of a toucan government with a toucan understanding. And let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, a little more precisely what I mean when I say a toucan understanding. I mean a certain defining smallness of vision, of character, of spirit in combination with the absence of a sense for humility and of a capacity to listen. Clearly, this is a government whose tone is set by a certain overabundance of self-satisfaction and all the insensitivity and arrogance that tends to go hand in hand with that. I mean, what incredibly self-focused insensitivity to have passed through third reading and into law a bill which obliterated the only level of government in Nova Scotia where women are adequately represented, school boards, and to have done it on International Women's Day. Where would you have to be to do that? What would have to be your, your defining frame of mind? Well, you might wipe out the school board positions of 57 women on International Women's Day if you were, in fact, just so enthralled with your own excellence that you thought yourself beyond such considerations. Or what would make you think, a year after the government's epic confrontation with the teachers of the province, which led to the single greatest diminishment of morale and motivation in the history of the teaching profession in Nova Scotia, what would make you think, where would your head be, to think that this might be a good time to unilaterally change the terms of who does and who does not have membership in the Nova Scotia Teachers Union? One could only come up with such an idea if the place where you were was some kind of a hyper self-satisfied uber entitled a bubble. And so, when the legislation to abolish school boards and change the terms of membership in the teachers union came a couple of weeks ago to the law amendments committee, the social media conversation, as members I'm sure are aware, was all about how many educators didn't really see the point of coming there to make submissions because they'd been there the year before, and they'd found the government members of the committee disconnected and inattentive and unengaged and rude. And what would lead you to conduct yourself in such a way toward the public, unless at some deep self-defining level you'd come to enjoy the mirror a lot and thought of yourself as something really special? So I think about the other day, Mr. Speaker, when the member from Dartmouth North was addressing here in the legislature income inadequacy issues. And all of a sudden, in her mid-explanation, she stopped up short when she realized that a couple of government members were sharing a little jo joke or laugh as she was speaking, and, and she said, let's just hang on a minute here. I'm talking about people that can't get their rent. 
I'm talking about people that have run out of food before the end of the month. I see people laughing, and the member from Dartmouth North said, and that is not okay. Well, of course it's not okay, but it's what you get when you have a two-can government with a two-can character, with a two-can understanding. Well, Mr. Speaker, we, we can anticipate, certainly, the shape of the coming discussions about the budget. Our party will raise in debate after debate after debate, in discussion after discussion, format of estimates after estimates format. We'll raise the places of need. We'll raise the places of pain, the places where we've fallen far behind in Nova Scotia. And in many such cases, a minister will then respond with a certain energetic self-righteousness about something in that particular area that their government has done. Not, mind you, some place where the need has been met or the pain has been addressed, or the crisis has truly been dealt with, but rather some corner of public policy where some manner of initiative has been taken sufficient for that minister, in effect, to be able to tick that box. And the existence of that particular box ticking will in many cases be sufficient to trigger the great sanctimoniousness machine at the Liberals Communications Centre and then we will be exposed to that minister's view of the epic wonderfulness of the government she or he is part of. And that, Mr. Speaker, will be one component of the response. Another component will be gratuitous, nefarious comparisons between whatever little they have done and their assessment of what was done by the government elected nine years ago in Nova Scotia. And some of these comparisons will be within the realm of fair comment, but a great many of them will be below the standard of integrity that the public have a right to expect in democratic discourse. And following all of this, Mr. Speaker, there's going to be a vote. And the budget will pass, and there will be an outpouring of the Liberals' self-defining self-congratulation. And that day, the same 40,000 people will continue to go to food banks. And the same $40,000 will continue to be the average amount owed by Nova Scotia's graduating students. And the Department of Health will continue to have more than 40,000 people registered as needing a family doctor. And why is that? It's because we're stuck in Nova Scotia for the moment with a two-can government whose upcoming year is going to be shaped by a two-can budget and whose contribution to the good of our province is severely restricted by their two-can point of view. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.